Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 52. As always, my name is Mark. I'm here with Orion. Hello. And today we are talking about 18xx games, a genre of board game that we have just recently in the past couple of months gotten into, and it has been a wonderful time. And we're here to talk to you about our foray into this subgenre of board gaming. Yeah, I think our first experience, or at least for me, was seeing some people play it off in the corner for like 12 hours both days of a game conference. I think they got there at like, well, actually more than that. I think they were there at like 9 a.m. before it even opened and they played until one in the morning or something like that. And it's just like the two of them grinding out. I think it was 18 OE. That's the big one, uh, yeah. And I was just like, whoa, that's huge. I would never want to do that. But here we are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we haven't played that one yet. I think that's considered the, like the behemoth of the 18xx games. Yeah. And it's not like we haven't played long games. Like we've played big coin games or b- big games of Twilight Imperium. But yeah, 18xx has always been kind of like that one weird room that you don't really go into at the at the cons. That's like the train it, room. It and, feels like it has kind of an ambiance of being difficult to approach or intimidating or its own little niche or something. Yeah, but I mean that shouldn't be the case though. Like yeah. they're not they're they're complex strategically, but they're not that complex in terms of rules overhead. They're generally heavy games. I'd say medium not, heavy. But they're not heavier than other things we've played. They're not heavier than a Lacerda game. I'd say they're lighter than most Lacerda games. Like I had a harder time learning Lisboa than I did an 18xx game for sure. Yeah. Well, okay. I think I think it's a, it's a game that you can get into and play as long as you don't mind. I don't know. You you can get in and play an 18xx. You will not be good at them. Oh yeah. No. The uh, the strategic complexity is much is very very it's high. Hugely deep. Yeah. I guess in terms of like the teach and the rules overhead, they're probably lighter than Lacerda, but they're every bit as complex. They're at least sort of. in the same conversation as yeah, some, some your typical so like, medium heavy Euro game. Yeah. A lot of people played that level of game, like Spirit Island's very popular, or Great Western Trail, or Terraforming Mars, or Terra Mystica, you or know. Something like Tzolkin, maybe. Yeah, maybe that I mean. Might be a hair lower, but. In that yeah, neighborhood. Yeah, those kinds of games are about as difficult to learn as an 18xx game. But 18xx still has this kind of reputation and, like you said, this kind of feeling that it's 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 a, something really difficult to jump into. We'll talk about that in more detail later, but let's talk about kind of the beginning of 18xx. When we say 18xx, yeah. there's a whole subgenre, I guess is the way you'd call it, sure. of these games. And they're all titled something like 1829, 1830, 1846, 1862, and on and on. I think there's one for every year in the 1800s. I wouldn't be which, surprised. Just about. Uh, well, now they're starting to put names on the back. It's just like 18, like the one you played the other day, it was 18 Mex. Yeah. So it was Mexico. Yeah. And they all have some kind of similar traits, similar structure, but then they all tweak, you know, how this this part works or how that part works and you end up with kind of a a shell or like a a template almost that you start with when people design these new games and then they pick a new time a new location and tweak some rules and you get a new version of the 18xx games yeah it feels very similar to like the power grid maps right the expansions for power grid they they change the map they change a few rules some things cut, happen at different times or you, you remove some cards or add a couple of bits. Uh, but the core game play is largely the same. Or it's similar to like you have like D20 based RPG systems, right? So you have Dungeons and Dragons creates this like D20 system. You have attributes, you have modifiers, but ultimately checks and everything are resolved with a, with a 20 sided die. But you have tons of RPGs that are D20 systems. It feels kind of like that. From what I understand, the very first one is 1829, back in 1974, by Francis Tresham. Slightly more famously known for creating the first Civilization game, which was then ported onto computers and turned into the Civilization games you all love. But it was originally a board game. 
And then in 1986, I believe he created 1830 as a kind of sequel to 1829. And that's the one that really took off and is still played regularly today by many, many people. I don't think there were any spinoffs of, of 1829 between that decade or so. But after 1830, like if you look on the 18xx family list of games on Board Game Geek, there's at least one new 18xx game created every year since then, I think. Yeah, there's a ton. We're, we're in a, a Discord group of a bunch of people who play these games, and they're constantly throwing out new years that I have never heard of before and talking about the differences between them. Like, oh, wow. All right, cool. <laughs> yeah, I looked it up, and it looks like there's like five to ten new ones every year now. Wow. So it's very much, you know, within our enthusiast hobby, it's very much, again, a sub-genre enthusiasm. But I don't think that necessarily means that you have to like you don't have to make it a lifestyle game like a magic the gathering player who only plays magic the gathering once you under like once you get like your first play of an 18xx done like you can kind of approach any of them at any time and it hasn't seemed that bad like you've been playing a lot more than i have but i don't feel particularly intimidated anymore now that i know the basics of it and it's just a matter of tweaking rules here and there to adapt to whatever game you're playing. Yeah, there's a couple kind of main traits that games tend to fall this way or that. And then when you learn a new one, you can essentially learn it by reading how is it different from one of these well-known ones. Yeah. And we, and we keep talking about how it's a sub-genre. That seems right because it's its own kind of niche within the genres of train games. So anything involving train, route building, that kind of thing, and, and stock games. Uh, games with stock markets. Uh, it's the kind of combination of those two things. Let's talk about what is what, kind of the general guidelines of what makes an 18xx game an 18xx game other than the name. Uh, <laughs> sure. So basically yeah. you've got a map. And as I said, one of the cool things is they tend to be set all over the place. So we've played maps that are set just in greater Cleveland. I've played the Midwest spanning from basically Chicago to Kansas City to Cleveland to Louisville, kind of that Midwest area. We played 1830 is like most of the East Coast out to about that same Midwest edge of the Great Lakes. You, you go around the Great Lakes and you get to Chicago on the map, uh, and it has some of Canada in it. Uh, we played 1822 Canada, which is all of Canada. And any, anyways, you've got this big, you've got this map. Some some are big, some are small. They tend to be hex grids. And you then play as an investor. You don't play as a company. You play as an investor. And the goal is to accumulate money. The ways you do that is generally to own stock in these various companies that will operate throughout the game. And whoever owns the most stock in a company holds the president's share and makes all the decisions for that company and operates it. Uh, the companies each operate in turn based on stock price. And so you go around the table and let's say I own the B&O and that's, its current stock price is 100 and if that's the highest, I would go first. And then maybe Mark owns the New York Central or and on and on. And so each company will lay track to connect different cities, which have various values. You'll also upgrade track throughout the game to create more connections and more valuable cities. And then you will run your trains. So if you've connected cities, then you can run the trains that you have bought and make some amount of revenue. And then you can choose to either pay that money out to all the shareholders, or you can withhold it inside the company to accumulate cash to generally to buy future trains. And then finally, you buy trains. And there's a train market, and they tend to get more powerful as you go with... Um, the, the numbers go up, which is generally how many stops you can make. So a three train can connect three cities, a four train, four cities, and so on. There's also an element of as you go, newer trains will cause the old trains to become obsolete and rust. So there's a there can be a train rush or um, you can be forced to keep upgrading your trains and buy buying newer ones, which also lets you do longer routes, but it requires you to manage your cash flow to be able to make that purchase because it can be a significant investment uh, and timing that is also very important and all of that 
all of that trackling and running trains and everything is is called the operating rounds. And the game is divided into stock rounds and operating rounds. So during an operating round, each company in turn does all that stuff. They operate. And then you'll have a stock round where the players, the investors, go around and they can buy and sell stock and start new companies. Yeah, so I mean the, the, the fundamental aspects of the game to me seem to be the idea that you're an investor, you you don't own a company, so you're buying and selling shares in companies either just to get value out of those companies because you think they will perform well and increase in value or to own the or take the president's share of the company in order to run them and, and operate them. You're trying to accumulate the most money. Sure. And you get that generally through dividends and stock appreciation. Right. So that idea, I think, is fundamental to the genre. The timing of alternating stock rounds and operating rounds to where you're buying and selling stock and when you're, you're the, the trains are actually running and generating uh, revenue. The idea of the trains in, in the track in some sense, because you upgrade track. Um, throughout the game, yep. uh, that progressing through time and trying to keep up with the new trains, uh, because a big aspect of 18xx strategy is making sure you're not getting caught with no trains and no money to buy a train that you need. And then the, the idea of route building in order to get the most value out of your routes, trying to access the most, uh, popular cities. So the bigger cities that are going to provide more points. Those are kind of the four things that seem fundamental to, to the genre. And in that sense, all of the game just kind of makes sense in terms of what you're doing. Once you once you figure out the agency of the player, which is an investor, and you figure out, okay, here's how you get value from running trains in a company, the rest really kind of organically happens. And when you get into various systems and various 18xx games there'll be lots of tweaks to incentivize and push players anew in uncomfortable directions but one of the coolest aspects of the game to me is that so much of the game is emergent from a relatively simple rule set in terms of heavy games there's not a whole lot of fiddliness there's a lot of counting but there aren't a lot of like little exceptions and tiny rules that you have to remember it's you buy stock, you sell stock, you figure out your routes. A lot of the puzzling is figuring out the timing of things, figuring out when your trains are going to rust, figuring out how other people may block you or harm you in some way by dumping companies on you or placing stations to block your routes. Or There's a lot of trying to manipulate incentives yeah. to get other people to do things you want or to know when you need to make a change before someone else blocks you or things like yeah. that. Yeah, and that's the difficulty of the game. It's not in kind of the rules overhead and puzzling through a game state that is imposed upon you by the rules of the game, but the game state is imposed upon you by your opponents. Right. It's not hard to find a legal move and execute it. Yeah. It is difficult to find the right move at the right time. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, a lot of, I mean... They almost have that dynamic of like playing an abstract game, playing chess, where it's so much about what your opponents are going to do rather than trying to puzzle through the mechanisms of the game. And that's where they it feels distinct from like a, a typical heavy Euro game, right? We go back to Lacerda games, where a lot of Lacerda games have some level of interaction, but a lot of it is trying to find an optimal path through the incentives the game is actually putting upon you in the game state and the different strategic options available there. So 18xx, it just feels different to me than a heavy Euro game. Yeah, and that's something that I think we've kind of talked about of, well, it's not really a Euro, it's not really an uh, Ameritrash game. It's got some elements of one, some elements of the other, but it, it's really its own thing in my mind. I wouldn't call 18xx games simulationist. They try to simulate some things, but they're very much about trying to create an experience where every player's decisions influence everyone else in powerful but indirect, mostly indirect ways. And there aren't, there aren't a lot of ways to really directly attack someone. You can drop stations to try to block routes, try to block access to particular routes. No, you. Everything else is really not, indirect. You can't do anything like, aha, I'm going to steal your train or I'm going to take this away from you you can indirectly attack them by 
board position or mm-hmm. number of stocks yeah. or or buying a new train that rusts their train and forces them to buy a new one. You, there's things like that. So it can be very brutal if for mm-hmm. some games in in the way that like food chain magnet can be brutal of just like Oh, that's arcade. the comparison. They feel like splatter games. Yeah. That's uh, really the comparison. Right? They're that, like brutal market efficiency and race, but there's not like combat. <laughs> there's no combat, but it's like the most brutal kind of indirect conflict. Yeah. Unforgiving, right? Yeah, that's the comparison to make. Last night we got in a situation where the player uh, we were playing 18 Max, which is set in Mexico, and the player to my left sold some of the, his stock to start a new company to get to raise cash to start a new company. And one of the rules is that once you sell stock in a stock round, you cannot buy that same stock again, so that there's consequences of your decisions, basically. Uh, so you can't just like buy and sell the same stock forever, which would be all sorts of exploity. But anyways. He sold some of his stock down to, he only had two or three, I think only two shares left. So it meant that the others of us at the table could start buying up that stock and take over the company. Uh, If we got to 30% ownership, we would take over the company. So uh, the player to my right and myself both started doing this because there were some cheap shares that he had just sold into the market. Uh, And we both went back and forth because he was going first. He got to the third share first. And then I decided to buy a third share myself. So we were both at 30% and I had enough cash to buy a fourth share and take over the company from the player to my right. And he did not have enough cash to buy another share. So he was forced to either let me take the Mexican Central Railroad or to sell a share of his stock which would then give me an opening to do the same thing to that company because he would be down to 30 or 40% and unable to buy back that, that company to protect it. So I was able to force him into a situation where he had to give me one of the companies, which is the sort of brutal interactions we're talking about. There was actually, last, last night it was such a good game, and there were so many moments like that that I felt like I was doing all these clever things like getting my operating order right and doing things in a certain order and moves like that in the stock round. I thought I was so good. And then I lost by like 20%. <laughs> the other guy just like ran the most, the best companies and crushed us. So. Yeah. Which actually segues nicely into the next thing I was going to talk about in that there seemed to be two kind of very broad design ideas or philosophies, I suppose, between the 18xx games that I've kind of recently discovered. I would call it a spectrum. Oh, it's certainly a spectrum. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, two different philosophies on, uh, that can kind of influence the the way that games play out. And we've been calling them operational and financial. Operational games focusing more on building up companies effectively. I don't know how much, like, train... Running good routes. Yeah, running good running routes. Good stock. Owning good stock, investing in the right companies. And, and, get, and getting a lot of value out of dividends and appreciation just by yeah. owning the best company, owning and running the best companies. Whereas more financial focused 18xx games will be more about manipulating stock prices, manipulating ownership, buying, selling companies, a lot more to do with the manipulation of stock than just running a good company. Stock market shenanigans. Yeah. I prefer, I think, the operational games. I don't know if I will always prefer that, but I think it's mostly because I haven't quite figured out the kind of things you can do, kind of weird tricks you can do in these more financial focus games. So tell me more about stuff that can happen there. I'm only scratching the surface. To give examples, 1846 is probably more on the operational side. That's the one we started with. That is the first one. It's a good first one, by the way. Yeah. Really it's nice. also really nice, nicely produced by GMT. And 1830 is more on the financial side. I, I, I think some of that is kind of depends on how many companies there are, because that means there's more, there's more room to dump a company and start a new company. And I, I think the number of companies gives you more room to maneuver. And also, I would say there's a kind of categorization of, full cap or full capitalization games and incremental capitalization games. 
Incremental cap is where every time you initially buy a share from the company, they get that much money because you bought that, you bought 10% of this company. So that $100 or whatever goes into that company and they can then spend it to buy trains or lay track or operate or do whatever. Uh, full cap games, you start buying stock, but they don't, they're not founded really until a certain amount is bought, usually 50 to 60% of the company. Once that much is bought, it gets its full IPO. <laughs> sure, yeah, cash. yeah. That's I mean that's how I think of it. And then you can the rest of the shares go into the general market pool, and you get all that money. So let's the so the difference there is that you can kind of create money out of thin air. Where if you buy six shares of something at a hundred dollars, you suddenly get a thousand dollars in the company. So you've created $400 of value that you can try to do something with. And, th- and thematically, that's essentially just like outside investment, right? Yeah. That, that fills up that extra Basically. 40%. Yeah. So then you can do things. Uh, one of the other rules is that you can buy trains from other companies. You don't have to buy them from the bank. So there can be a lot of manipulation of if you are operating two different companies, you can buy from yourself essentially and move trains between your companies to shuffle money around. And then you could potentially sell off. You could move all the trains from one company to another and all the cash. And then you could sell all of that stock so that someone else who owns a bit of it gets stuck owning it. And now they're on the hook to provide a train for the company. Yeah. One of the, one of the things that's, that's really interesting that I got, troubled with in the the game of 1830 I played is that once you own 20% of any company, you could potentially get stuck controlling that company. You're vulnerable to having it dumped on you. Yeah. Uh, So that's something to watch out for. Uh, Another situation that came up last night is we were getting to the end of the game and one of the players knew he was going to lose. So he was trying to make moves to shake things up. And so he started two new companies in the last stock round and they floated and then he was going to try to manipulate them such that and i own i own stock i owned at least 20 percent in two of the companies that he owned. he had like three different companies he was he, he had charges for at, by the end, the end of the game and i had uh at least 20 percent in two of those companies so he was going to try to manipulate so that one of the companies would have no train and be forced to buy a train. And th- and so that it, it, you, the investor player, have to make up the difference if a company doesn't have enough money to buy a train. Because they tend to get very expensive at the end of the game. Uh, so that can be a significant significant chunk of money. Forced train purchase. He was going to try to engineer it so one of his companies would have a forced train purchase. And he would have to sell some of his stock to raise the cash for that train. And he was going to sell stock in one of the companies that I owned. So that the president's share would transfer to me because I would then be the majority shareholder and I would be stuck with this trainless company. Wait, wait, wait. so there's a forced train purchase. So the company had to buy a train. No, no. He was going to have two companies without a train. Oh, and he was going to dump one in order to buy the train for the other. Yes. That's tricky. And you can do that during operating rounds, not during stock rounds, because... Train you can purchase trains across during operating rounds, and forced train purchases is one of the few ways that you can sell stock during an operating round. So that was that was crazy. It didn't <laughs> actually happen, and it wouldn't have actually it wouldn't have helped him. But I didn't even know that was possible. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So there's things like that. I've talked to other players where in 1830 they'll start a company and maybe operate it for one round, and then immediately dump it and start a new company even if other people could take it over. Or, and by dump it, I don't mean dump it on another player. I just mean sell down to only the 20% president share to get cash to start another company just to kind of churn through starting companies. Interesting. Um, and I, I assume the reason to do that is to raise that extra capital in a full cap game to do something with. Because you're effectively injecting more total money into the game on a full cap game. Yeah, money into a place where you have control over it. I assume you have to run the companies for at least one OR so that you can spend that money to buy a train and then move it over and then dump it and start a new company. But maybe it's just 
maybe you're just trying to get as many president shares as you can because the share density is higher for those. Yeah, in 1830 is interesting. Well, that's what I'm saying. 1830 is interesting because a company in a couple of the 18xx games I've played, including 46, which we'll come back to because, again, that's a good starting point, a company that exists has to have a train. In 1830, you only have to have a train if your home station is connected to another city. So if the route isn't built yet, the company doesn't have to have a train. Yeah. So you can do stuff where you kind of get, again, that, that additional 40% of money kind of injected into the company, not need to buy a train and manipulate it somehow. Well, what you do is you buy a train and give it to another company, and then you just kind of suitcase this yeah. company off in the corner and hope that it doesn't have a route, that no one else kind of builds up to it and force you to have a route for at least a while. Because that was something I accidentally, I think I accidentally did in the game of 1830 was I, I just through kind of building up my own routes because I didn't know what I was doing. I was like, well, I'm just going to do my thing and run a nice solid company. And uh, I connected someone and, and it really put the hurt on them because they all of a sudden needed to buy a train for this company that was just kind of sitting there. So that's an interesting dynamic in that particular game. There's a lot of things like that. Yeah. And every game is a little different and it gives you different opportunities like that because the map will be different. So there's different points of tension. The timing that companies come out in tends to be significant. Some companies are good at the beginning. Other companies are good once there's some track laid. Some tra some companies you basically can't start at the beginning because you have to upgrade their home tile to be able to go anywhere. And so you can't you can't really have a route until you get up to the higher tier trains which allow you to build a higher tier track yeah and again one of the things i want to emphasize in this podcast is that 18xx isn't necessarily as intimidating as it looks i think oh, part yeah. of that is you know when you're talking about okay certain companies you don't want to buy till late in the game where you'll get blocked somehow or there's certain things you want to watch out for a lot of I guess the blessing of what we've had is a really good group of people who have been willing to teach us the games and then point out those things. Oh yeah, I, which I, I think has been key. If you go into it blind and it's a and it's an eighteen XX game that has pitfalls like that, it could I think really lead to some frustrating situations. So I guess if you're interested in these kind of games, like see if there's a local meetup group that plays eighteen XX games because if you get a group of people like we've been playing with who love the game, and there's, they're certainly better than me, you've been competing pretty well, uh, but who are willing and nice enough to say, okay, you, you really don't want to do that <laughs> for this reason, yeah. and help you kind of learn the strategies and the weird quirks of each particular game as you go, I think you'll pick it up really well and then start to understand the strategy deeper. That's at least where I think I'm at, right? I've, I've picked up things here and there uh, just by playing, you know, I've played th four different ones, um, and I feel like I have a decent grasp of at least how to not fail completely at a game, even though I, don't, I haven't won yet. But yeah, find a good group. I, that that sure. would certainly be my recommendation. All these things I'm throwing out are stuff that I've learned from playing and from playing with other people who are doing them. And then we rehash the game and we talk about it afterwards. And I was just saying the other last night, it's, it's so, for me at least, it's so interesting to watch how the games develop. Like even if you're getting smashed, Watching the game develop and seeing how a decision at the beginning of the game makes a huge difference later on in the game. So that decision of buying an extra two train at the beginning of the game can mean that, you know, the fours come out sooner, which rusts the twos, which lays new track, which forces all these other things. You get a lot of these butterfly effects. And it's so interesting to see, well, you know, what if I had done this instead of that, you know? What if I try to rush a bunch of trains? What if I start with this company in the corner? You know, what if I start with this private company? What one thing in these games is there tend to be kind of major companies that run these routes like we've been talking about. And then there are minor or private companies which are either like a little regional railroad or they have some special power or something. So combining those in new and interesting ways, bidding up certain shares or not, like we were saying, selling down to a present share to start a new company immediately, things like that. Just like, I just, I just want to know, like, what, what if I do this, right? What if I do that? You know, what if I try to combine these things and how does it play out? And trying to predict what other people will do 
it's uh, it's so cool. Yeah, and again, it goes back to this kind of contrast with many Euro games, whereas I think a lot of the enjoyment of a Euro game, especially a heavier Euro game, is this kind of exploration of the game's mechanisms and try to figure out kind of how to optimize that path. In 18xx, a large part of the appeal seems to be a strategic exploration of more, again, player-driven, nuanced, down-the-line things rather than... I, I'm finding finding it hard to explain the difference. Like like you said, small things, small decisions you can make in an 18xx game can, can impact things later on, but it, it funnels through a whole bunch of player decisions in the process they're maybe incentivized differently because of that but it's still this kind of mutual exploration of strategy between all the different players trying to get a leg up um, and certainly the game systems allow for that and we see even small changes even just the difference between a full capitalization game and a partial capitalization game uh, can create all kinds of oh, different sweet. strategies it's massive you can kind of poke and prod at those things and do try different things and and see how the whole rest of the group reacts and what spirals out from that uh, which i think is, is wonderful and these games are highly interactive oh yeah so there's a lot of interpersonal interplay and you could try to convince someone to not build that track and that will help them lay other track. I mean, you can either get some negotiation in there if you can align your incentives mm -hmm. in such a way. Another example from last night, we were in a point where we were buying the higher level trains and it was going to, it's this crazy rush where the first six train bot rests the threes and the second six rests the fours. So it's really, it gets really fast in there. And I made the decision. I had one, one of my companies was running pretty well. And I made the decision to pay out the first operating round because there were three ORs so that my share price would advance so that I would be first in the next set of ORs or the next OR. I would operate first so that I could basically run my trains an extra time because I knew another player was going to buy the second six and rest my fours. Mm. Or my threes, I forget which one. But I needed to run them and withhold to be able to buy the next tier train. But I paid out the first time so that I could then go first in the next operating round to get an extra run out of my trains, basically. And I thought that was, well, <laughs> toot my own horn here for a minute. But I thought it was a really cool point of looking at what other people are going to do and making, you know, ordering my my play in such a way to get an advantage because I can predict, well, he's going to buy a train, so if I go before him, I get to run an extra time. And there's so many things like that because operational order, essentially turn order, is based on share price. If you sell a bunch of stock of one company, that tends to depress the share price, so then that company goes later in the round. And then maybe you can start a new company that goes ahead of it and... I don't, I don't know. There's just things you can do like there's just moves you can do like that. You can mm -hmm. manipulate turn order. You know, you can you can choose to not buy extra stock in the stock round so that you get priority deal, which means you go first in the next stock round, which gives you more opportunities to buy or sell stock up before other people get an action. There's just there's so much stuff like that on top of a strategically heavy game of figuring out all the routes and tokens and companies and everything. There's all this jockeying for position that you do with other players yeah and even in our our group uh that we've been playing with we have a little discord channel and the discussions after the games have been so cool oh, yeah. and i love how this kind of game generates that level of discussion of like people pointing out okay here's where i think i made the wrong decision because it caused this this and this to happen and everything kind of balancing on a knife's edge of you can look back and point and, f and find the places where you could have and should have chose differently in order to create a different spiraling outcome which is so cool so i mean to me the the group dynamic has been this one of like again mutual strategic exploration None of you are super competitive. No one's out trying to win awards or bragging rights. You're you're trying all to win, but you're enjoying the process of understanding each individual game as you play it, which is just one of the coolest things in board gaming. I mean, that's why we do this podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, of, of the, the post game recap or 
you know, after action report and sure. here we are two years later or whatever it's been. Yeah, yeah. I mean, although we never did a whole lot of like a particular play of a game, it's always often about kind of the, the games themselves. Um, yeah. And that's been my think, focus on it. I think 18xx lends itself to that because there's so much you can say, you can compare it to other 18 games. You can compare 18 Max to 18 Canada or 1830 or whatever. And you can say, oh, because of this rule change, I thought about the game differently and I made this move instead of that move or how it changed the game. Or you can only buy one train per turn at the beginning in this game, which meant the pacing is different. And there's all that sort of stuff that you can go back and look at and analyze. And as a group, we've been doing that. And it's, oh, it's so good. Yeah, I've approached it a bit differently and at least the appeal to me, like I said, I, I think I prefer these operational type games and the big or one of the big draws to me of 18xx is that they create really interesting narratives, just emergent dynamic narratives in the game. And that's always something that I find interesting in board games. I like all kinds of, you know, I like kind of dry point salad games, but I tend to, if you look at the games that I rate the highest, right? You like dank games? Yeah, right. I mean, look at the, look at my top games. You've got Gloomhaven. Yeah. You've got Spirit Island, Netrunner, Twilight Imperium. Oh, yeah. Space Alert, all of those games, Twilight Struggle, all of those games have really awesome narratives that emerge throughout the game. In fact, that may be the number one thing that pushes a game from kind of great to incredible in my mind. Suburbia, right? Yeah. Like if Suburbia didn't have those elements, I I would I wouldn't like it nearly as much. Oh yeah. If they weren't if you weren't like looking back at your suburb and being like why did I put the junkyard next to the housing development? No wonder all the people left my town <laughs> or these just like crazy things you did. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be as good. Yeah. And, and a lot of people, when they think of narrative, they think of something like, you know, betrayal or Gloomhaven, but that's not necessarily the case. Like I've, the narrative in Twilight Struggle or it can be subtle or Netrunner or these 18 XX games can be and often are far more interesting because they emerge from the players as much as they do the game. It's not just reading some text. Mm -hmm. It's things that happen because of the game as this kind of incentives platform creates the narrative. And some of that is certainly the play group, and it helps oh, a ton yeah. to have a good play group. Yeah. I mean, we've been really lucky. You know, we play a lot with just kind of our the people we knew beforehand, but the groups we've kind of poked into mm -hmm. have been universally we've awesome. Really cool we've things. met some really awesome people and have fortunately stayed away from a lot of the horror stories out there of, of bad board game play groups. But yeah, a lot of it's the people. So the narrative aspect of these games is so cool. Just kind of going through the ones I've played. So the first play of 1846, there was the storyline of like, <laughs> I I had this one company that's kind of off in the corner. It's a Midwest company. So in that game, it's, it's the Midwest, but most of the trains are coming in from the East just because that's how our nation built up. Uh, but there's one that comes from what, St. Louis? Yeah, you start at St. Louis, Kansas City, somewhere down there. Yeah, uh, and I happened to get that one in the beginning because that was seemed like one to grab uh and i'm like well i'm kind of off in the corner by myself here it's a midwest company i'm transporting stakes i'm just gonna be a nice solid good company and uh just With lots of government subsidies <laughs> well we'll ignore that part <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to kind of ignore all the craziness on the East, try to run my company well. Solid values. Yeah, family values. Yeah, exactly. Uh, transporting stakes to the good, hardworking people of America while there were all kinds of crazy financial shenanigans going on in the East. Oh, there was <laughs> massive fraud in that game. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was, uh, and that game's not designed for that to happen. It was really <laughs> weird. But, I mean, I still remember that play of the game. Oh, yeah. And I still remember making jokes about how my, you know, my my company has been doing great for generations. It's a family owned company, and oh, yeah. we're just over here transporting our stakes to Chicago. Well, other do, people do you are bankrupt. Thirty, where a game where you and I traded the Boston back and forth like three times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then the the nineteen thirty game, the stupid company going from Boston to uh, New York. Did they even? Oh, I guess they did just barely. Make I it. waited just too long to like get rid of my shares and you dumped it on me. And then did I give it back to you at some point? You let me buy it back from you, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Because I built it up into something decent, although. You built it up a bit. A bit. It was struggling. Uh, and then there was that, that silly route through Providence. 
that I oh, didn't yeah. want to upgrade for some reason. Yeah. yeah, because it would it was blocking everyone else or something. Oh yeah, it was just gonna make everyone else's routes better into Boston than it would make my route better into Boston. Yeah. So it just the the train that. from New York to Boston made this really awkward loop through Basically. like Providence and the Cape or something. Yeah, it had to go all the way through the Cape. <laughs> so you had to stop at all these little towns that slowed down your train. <laughs> It was really funny. And uh, the other thing in that game was the lack of the K tile. Oh, <laughs> that's K right. K. Oh, yeah. That's an aspect of these games we didn't talk about. This might be... I don't know what I think of this as a as a game concept, but in some of the games, like the, the route tiles are very limited. So there may only be two, you know, one or two tiles that make a particular pattern, and then that's it. So you could be blocked out of building a route you want because someone else sniped that tile. Yeah, so if you run which out of makes... straight track, just like the engineers are like today, no straight track. We're just going to curve back and forth like a <laughs> snake, uh, which makes literally no thematic sense, which is why it bothers me, but it can make for some tension, I suppose. But yeah, there was one particular track that, well, someone didn't want to upgrade their town because it would open up the tile that was there for someone else to buy which would make their route really awesome yeah it was very funny and then i played four of these right oh i played 49 which is the, the just meanest oh that one's horrible not not like necessarily between players just like everything is hard everything's play. incredibly expensive so like in most of these games the the money scale you're looking at is like an early train is like 150 to 200 dollars to buy like your starter train Usually the first trains are like 80 or 100. I'm and thinking of 46. It's like 200. No, the three fives are. Oh, are they? Okay. I'm, yeah. And then you build up and the last trains will cost like 700 to 1,000. Yeah. And then it seems like in 1830, track lay is free for most of the places. They'll have thematic things like if you go through the mountains, like in Appalachia, it's real expensive to cross the mountains there. In 1830, uh, sometimes like in 1846, the tile, each track lay will be a base of like $20. 1849, I'd say two thirds of the map costs at least $80 to build on. <laughs> it's like 80, 120, 160 yeah. for most of the it's map. The mountains in Sicily. Yeah, it's set in Sicily, so you kind of have your kind of, everything's pushed toward the ocean. So you have all these coastal routes. Mm -hmm. uh, there's like a volcano that erupts at a certain time and literally wipes out a city, yeah. wipes that's, out everything. There you have to rebuild. That's another thing with these games is that to varying degrees, they tend to explore the history of a certain region and time and how the trains there develop. They're not quite as historically focused as war games, which will. Ditch it, everything for historical focus. Yes, but it also varies. Some designers yeah. mu care much more about that, and others are more about, like... Tile limitations. <laughs> no, well, maybe, but more like, I'm trying to make an interesting game. Sure. Not necessarily a game that kind of reenacts the development of the railroad system in Mexico, or in Canada, or in sure. the UK, or wherever. Yeah. So then, yeah, so the story in Sicily was <laughs> me promising things over and over inadvertently that I couldn't keep because that one was weird. There were lots of weird stuff on that one. But basically, me and this other person got kind of stuck with these two companies that were not good, mostly because they weren't near any other cities. And to get to the other cities, they had to lay expensive track. But we could connect our two cities by both laying track in that direction, which I kind of promised to do. And then I looked at the costs and I'm like, I can't do this and also buy a train. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> uh, so there was a bit of, a, of an exchange where she's like, you promised to lay this track. And I'm like, how am I supposed to pay for it? We figured out something. It was very weird. I had that one also had two different types of track and a narrow and wide gauge, which complicated things. But I like looped around a mountain pass for one to get something. <laughs> and then w like halfway through the game, we connected the original plan with the help of a third company. But yeah, that one was just difficult. And then our play of 1822 CA was like some kind of giant historical epic. That was almost like a game of TI or something. Oh yeah. It's well, it's like you see history developing with all the routes springing up and the mm -hmm. companies you getting like absorbed. You of the board game, the board as it develops. Oh yeah. It'd be really cool. That one also had 
almost everything by auction, which I found very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love the auctioning. I think it's much more interesting than kind of either random or kind of weirdly semi random turn order dynamics. I prefer the auction thing. I think yeah. that's better from a gameplay perspective and it's just more interesting. That game it's just an epic. Like it it plays out like an epic. I don't know how what keep, time frame. Keep the peg weird. <laughs> oh yeah. Apparently we learned that Winnipeg is called the peg. In, like, trucker circles or something. Yeah, yeah. So, and it's also the most valuable city in that game. And so th- there's multiple tire layers. There's one that basically fuses it all together into one giant omnidirectional hub. And then there's another version of the top-level track, which basically segregated it into three different subsections. And so we, we went for that one, which makes the city worth more, but it's harder to use because you have to come in and out certain sides of the hex yeah which was the thing in many cities in that game you could either you could either make the city kind of all connect into a hub but be worth less or keep it kind of oddly designed and shaped keep it weird (laughs) and have it get more value for that route so we kept the peg real weird yeah (laughs) made a lot of money off of that (laughs) So all these games, they all have the same core fundamental systems. Once I learned the first one, it hasn't been more than 15 or 20 minutes to learn the differences of a new one, but they provided so such a wide variety of different play experiences and stories that I will remember in my mind. That's just really remarkable. That's my main appeal of 18xx. Like I love the strategic stuff and I like kind of watching it from afar, but you know, I, I posted about this in the Discord group. Like, I really like the beginning stages of playing a, a complicated game or a heavy game where I just kind of play by feel and kind of poke around. Right. You don't know what the right move is. You're just trying to intuit what you yeah. should be doing. And 18xx has a great kind of play by your gut, poke around. Like, like that's how you're. That's how most people will be playing until you've played, you know, fifteen, twenty times of a particular one, mm-hmm. and then they're going to start really optimizing things. Yeah, but I yeah, mean, that's like, the appeal. Eighteen thirty. There's a lot of theory out there. Of basically, there's people that have played it, you know, a hundred times or something, and just know like, okay, you've won the game because of this. Like, there will be, there are people that will call the game after the initial auction. Just just based on that. Yeah, I mean, that's by far the most popular one, and it's been around... 40 years. Yeah. 40 years, so I can I can certainly see that. Way before I got to that point, I'd probably move on to a different game, but that's just me. Like, yeah. if you want to get really into the optimization and, and strategy well, and getting into the nitty-gritty of the game, you can do that also. 18xx is both deep is strategically each game is deep but it's also broad because there's so many different ones Mm -hmm. and there's so many different designers that each have kind of their own take or their own um, emphasis or their own history and you can kind of see like this designer likes this type of game or their early games were like this but then later they changed to be like this and i mean there's so many like sub trends you could look at in there if you're into that sort of thing yeah, so, I mean, that's the appeal of these games, and, and I hope you can tell from our enthusiasm how much we've been enjoying it. Um, Ryan's been playing almost almost weekly. I've played four different ones, and I've played probably eight times overall of 18xx games, and I love it, even playing kind of semi-casually at this point. Um, I haven't gotten quite into kind of the post-game recaps or thinking about my decisions that deeply other than recognizing, oh, yeah, I made a mistake there somehow. (laughs) But, I mean, we're both enjoying it so much. Yeah, I don't know if I've not been able to sleep for thinking about what I should have done in the game this much since, like, the early days of Resistance or something. Because I used to just, like, agonize over... Not agonize, but I used to replay and rethink Resistance games years ago Mm -hmm. all night and try to think of like how could i have what could i have said differently or what should i have done in this situation or that situation and it's the same sort of thing with 18xx of just like running through to my mind and thinking about like what if i had done that and you know that was a mistake or that was a good move but i should have done this or you know maybe i should have bought those trains in the other order or maybe i should have not fought for that company and done something else or i don't know (laughs) And so I want to keep playing them, both new games to see other variations of it, but also the same games multiple times to go back through and be like, well, 
I've played it, you know, once or twice. I know kind of the basics, what these companies look like. Now let's try to, you know, iterate on the same formula that, you know, that same game and go deeper and, Mm -hmm. and start playing out some of those different, uh, variations. Just a moment to talk about kind of the, the barriers, I suppose, to 18xx. Like we talked about, it does kind of have this reputation as being kind of an insider's club that's hard to get into, you know, the kind of the cordoned off room of people kind of staring at boards and calculators uh, all day instead of playing other board games. I mean, I haven't, like, all the experience I've had with people who play 18xx games have been great. I can totally see that happening, though. Like, with any kind of niche or or more focused sub-genre or sub-hobby, you're going to get a higher concentration of people who are really, really into that thing. Because, just because it doesn't, if it doesn't have as much broad appeal, the people who stick around are the ones who get really, really into it. And sometimes that can create you know, bad first time experiences if they all know a whole bunch of what's going on and you're kind of struggling to keep up with their thinking. So hopefully if you want to play Teen XX games, you find a really good group. I'd say the other, the big barrier and in, in, in a distinction we haven't talked about between 18XX and other games is just the sure calculation that has to happen. Not difficult calculation, but lots of just adding things up over and over again yeah, and up, route optimization yeah can be tedious so you have I, even I, played 18 uh, cle oh i've where, heard that one's that one brutal is, that one's the worst because there's this quote-unquote national but it's not really national it's just like a regional transit authority that kind of sucks up instead of companies going bankrupt or whatever the they just kind of get absorbed into the main company and then that company will end up with a ton of tokens and a bunch of trains so you have to calculate routes for like five trains with tokens all over the map or something at the Ugh. end of the game. Which for like the AI, basically? For the AI, yeah. basically. And that lasts too long. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I just say, you know, a lot of people, I think, pack calculators. They get little cheap calculators and pack them into their Can games. I just pull out my phone. Oh, yeah. There's yeah. Also, uh, You're going to want a calculator at some point. There's also tables that tell you like, Nine shares at 17 is whatever, you know, if you don't want to do that arithmetic. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you're going to want to pull out a calculator. But honestly, everyone has a phone, so it's not going to be that big of a deal unless you just really don't like using calculators in your game. So, I mean, there's there's certainly going to be a large number there's of people. There's a lot of arithmetic in yeah. these games. There's going to be a lot of people where that's just going to feel like a chore instead of something interesting. And frankly, you know, you created a nice spreadsheet that kind of does the end of the game, which is what can start to feel like a mathematical chore, and that's helped a lot. But the rest of it... Uh, you, you can get to a point where... There are basically no more interesting decisions to be made. You're just upgrading a town here or there to add 10 to your route, and you're just playing out until the bank breaks. Yeah. Um, so the last set of ORs can be can be a bit dull uh, in that sense. But it's more just at that point, you're seeing the result of all of your decisions for the previous couple hours. Which is an interesting thing, because we talked about this before with engine building games, where games, a lot of the times we feel like the games will cut it off almost too early with 18xx they certainly err on cutting it off too late (laughs) but i don't mind it especially once you have like the spreadsheet thing because you just plug it in because you kind of get to see the fruits of your labor Mm -hmm. which i enjoy it doesn't make it doesn't make necessarily for an optimal quote-unquote gameplay experience but i enjoy it certainly The, the biggest difference it makes is you can make decisions to intentionally try to prolong the game an extra set of ORs or end it a set of ORs early because most games you'll play out the whole set. So two or three operating rounds for all the companies, even if the bank breaks early. Like Just like a regular game where you play out the round, this yeah. you play out the set of ORs, which can be a lot of money. And so if you are trying to catch up to someone, maybe you want the game to go longer or maybe you want it to stop or I, I don't know, there, there's... There's a little back and forth there, but for the most part, the end of the game is just kind of calculate out the the rest of the money and, and see the outcome of all your decisions. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, by this point, you probably know if you're going to hate 18xx, but I think I would say if if what we've said sounds potentially interesting, I'd say go for it. Try to find a game of one of the simpler 18xx's. The I mean, one, again, we started with is 46. 
yeah, which a is a f- pretty simple, easy. It's designed to be gentler to newcomers. Yeah. I've heard that 1889 is supposed to be a good one to start with, but although I haven't played it, those are the two I see mentioned the most. But honestly, if if you have an opportunity to get in on a game of 1830, as long as everyone else is understands and is the kind of person who will be friendly to a new player, because that one can get brutal, jump into 1830. Jump into any of them. Yeah. Just, just know that... There's, some are going to be more complex than others. Yeah, and some have more hard edges and more room to trip up and go bankrupt or yeah. things like that. I mean, the the thing that I've done and I think is a good idea just generally in games, if you're getting, if you're playing a game for the first time or second time and you still haven't quite gotten comfortable with the strategy and you're playing with people who are more experienced, um, I think a lot of people get caught up on like, well, I don't want them to like, run the game for me if I ask for help or not feel like they can give an answer. So what I'll do is if I'm not sure about something, I'll just be like, okay, guys, I just need you to tell me, is this just the stupidest decision I could make? Like, I just want to know if something's catastrophically bad. And I found that everyone's willing to tell you if you're about to make a catastrophic mistake in an 18xx games. Where if you're like, well, what should I do here? Or you think this is a good idea? That's a completely different question because it could be maybe it's a decent idea for you, but it hurts them and they don't really want to give you an answer or they don't really know what you all you really need to know is, is this just a stupid decision? Is this game breaking? Yeah. Or is this going to ruin something? Or is this just really bad? Yeah. So, I mean, that applies to many games, right? Sure. Anyone's going to be willing to help out a new player by saying yes or no to that kind of question, whereas a what should I do here is such a difficult thing to answer and and hard. Mm -hmm. Another maybe barrier is the production of these games tends to be a little more spotty. Oh, yeah. I'm really like... It threw me me for a bit, and now I'm just used to it. Oh, well, okay. (laughs) Compared to, you know, anything from Stonemaier Games, right, these look... These are not pretty games compared to, you know. Yeah, we'll say that. And also, some of them are, like, produced from some guy out of his garage or something. So, I don't know this for sure, but I get the sense that the supply of 18xx games, or at least some of them, is... It can be a lot harder to actually get your hands on a copy, and there's people that will basically print and play these games Um, yeah it's very much especially for you know except for the the handful of major ones yeah so like there's a lot of 1830 you can get from mayfair that's a big release i'll I'll say there's a lot of tiny little designers that have made an 18xx game and those won't necessarily they won't necessarily be published by even a smaller publisher like they might be published by a very tiny niche publisher or just print and play yeah i love that gmt is getting more into it they they just announced their third one so they have 1846 they're in the process i think in 1862 is in the has been accepted through p500 and they just announced the third one which i don't remember what it is but the gmt production it's got the big chunky cardboard tiles and you know a nice mounted board and all that like with wargaming you know there's a lot of really small niche publishers and they're not necessarily going to use the component quality that you would expect from a larger publisher so instead of cardboard they have these little kind of plastic tiles plastic or like laminated paper almost yeah things like that you'll you'll they may not have a mounted board you might get some paper mats yeah Um, another another little kind of oddity of 18xx games is that you never play with money in the box even if it comes with it oh yeah you always play with chips oh yeah this is a weird cultural thing i don't even know why they pack money in the boxes well, I don't know if they usually do. 1846 did. Okay, so I maybe don't... only the larger releases. Yeah. Yeah, but every 18x hex player uses poker chips. It's just a thing. Yeah. I it's I mean, I see why. They're nice. The poker chips feel nice and you can count them out easily and they work well. Mm-hmm. So, that's just the thing that's happened. That's just the thing. And they don't look pretty, but they're very functionally designed. Yeah. And and even across games, like all the colors are the same. You'll go from yellow to green to brown to silver. Kind of the shares, and you know, they'll use small cards for shares and and private companies. And there's lots of design consistencies or visual design consistencies across the games. Everything that I've seen is a hex board. 
everyone has these little circular tokens that represent your stations in different cities. You know, the trains are all cards. There's a charter, which is a bigger piece of sheet or whatever for to represent a company, things like that. Those are the sorts of things that help you pick up a new game when you, you're you jumping into your first play of a new 18xx and you say, all right, there's the stock market. It's a 2D stock market. Cool. Here's the board. Here's some off-board locations. Here's where the different companies start. There's the set of track. And once you've played a couple of these, you can... You basically just learn them by comparison of, say, what are the differences to something else that I've played? It's kind of cool once you know the terminology because they can be like, okay, the 2D stock market, half cap train, uh, the trains, the threes expire on the fives and the fours on the sixes. And you can almost describe the whole yeah. game in a paragraph. Basically. Yeah. Well, and it's also this like this lingo that you pick up yeah. and it, but it's it's actually really straightforward and clear once you played a couple times oh yeah and it makes yeah. sense immediately like yeah. the first time you someone explains it you're like oh okay yeah now i know what that means and i will use it in every game from now on. yeah so i guess the conclusion in terms of accessibility is that you know if you've played medium or heavy euro games you're not going to find anything here that's too weird or overwhelming and from that perspective it's almost certainly going to be you know group dependent more accessible than you think on a variety of levels. This has so far been kind of the gaming experience of 2019 for me is getting into these games. Well, 1822CA went from unknown to top of your 18, uh, 2018 list in a day. Yeah, I mean, part of that is that I had a lot of games that were like, yeah, these are good games, but no like true excellent games on my 2018 list. And then that one popped in. Right. But partially, it's just my favorite one so far by a decent margin. 18xx? Oh, yeah. Okay. For sure. I mean, that one's, you know, it's like playing Comet and then playing Twilight Imperium. To me, that's how that mm. game felt. Like, just the scale of it and the immensity and the narrative and all that. Like, yeah. Well, it, it hit all the things that I think I enjoy about the games, and it focused on those things and didn't focus as much on the parts that I'm not so sure about. So that yeah. worked no, really it was, well. It was really good, sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's 18xx. That's a, that's at least our, our start into 18xx. Orion has some of the strategies understood, but he'll even tell you that there's a lot that Oh, he I'm hasn't constantly gotten, finding out new yeah. things and trying to just keep my head above water. You know, I, I'm at the point where I can try to intentionally do something. It's not necessarily good, and I don't even succeed. I just, I'm aware enough to try to do things. Yeah. Whereas I just kind of, to paraphrase the Who, play by sense of smell and have fun with it. And that's even been fun. I come in probably the bottom half most of the time. But tomorrow we're going to introduce Amber to it. I think she'll like 1846. And Ben too, yeah. So we're kind of like little 18xx evangelists now. Are we a part of a cult? Is that is that what this, is this the beginnings of a cult? Is 18xx the, the board game equivalent of, of cult activity? There's like 18xx, there's the Warhammer people. Magic's really mainstream, so you guys insert like X niche CCG here. They're probably cultish. I guess we were in the Netrunner, but Netrunner's cool and a good game. I don't know. I love board games. I love that we play all kinds of board games, and this is just kind of the new kind of board game we've we've discovered and gotten into. So it's exciting. It's awesome, and you should play them. Yep, indeed. I think that's all we got. Thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget to check out thethoughtfulgamer.com. I will hopefully be... I'll, I'll probably try to get a review of 1846 up after tomorrow's game with Amber. So I've played it a handful of times now. Uh, so we can get something written on the website. The cat's saying hello. Don't forget to check me out on social media. Twitter and Facebook are the ones that I'm on. Uh, rate and review the podcast if you could on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you would like to watch our podcast live, get part of our Discord group where we're trying to get other people, other patrons to play more 18xx. Go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. Any and all support is greatly appreciated. We're very, very close to getting back to the goal where I give away games to people. I've already sent out three games, but we drop below the threshold. So as soon as we hit another seven bucks per month, I'm going to run another giveaway because yeah. we're it's been due, but we've been below the threshold. So if you want actually really good chance of 
getting a game, all things considered. In in terms of giveaway odds, the odds here are going to be pretty good. Chip in a bit on Patreon. If you just want to do it for the month, like just one month, you'll insert your, your money for a month and then leave. That's fine by me. And Mark gives away good games. So. Yeah, and I only give away good games. I, I go through the previous couple of months and I pick out the best games that I've played that those months that you know are available to buy on Amazon. Uh, and I give you a choice of three or four games. So only good games, guaranteed. Patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>